Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to DeWitt Community Church Online as we gather for worship during this time of social distancing. For now, we're gathering as an online uh, worship uh, community until it's safe once again to meet in person. We're also providing many ways during this time to connect during the week. For a weekly schedule, uh, please visit our website, uh, dewittchurch.org. If there's any way that we can be of assistance to you during this time, please don't hesitate to call the church office. It's open from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And also remember, your pastoral staff is always available by phone. So please don't hesitate to use the pastor on call line if there's any way that we can be helpful to you. And the number for that is on the website as well. This morning, I want to also thank you for your continuing generosity towards the ministries of DeWitt Community Church. Thanks to your continuing support, we're able to carry on the ministries of the church in this new virtual environment, as well as prepare to resume our life together as a congregation uh, once it's safe to do so. And while we cannot be physically present, ministry continues, and we really appreciate your continuing support if at all possible. Checks can be mailed to the church office or you can contribute online by going to givedewittchurch.org. Now I do want to mention that today will be my last day with you until September 8th. I'll be beginning my sabbatical starting tomorrow, Monday, May 18th. Uh, We'll be putting up a video on Facebook and YouTube on Monday morning at 8 a.m., detailing the sabbatical plan, and I hope you'll watch it. Uh, I will also be available on, it'll also be available on our website, so hopefully you can watch it there if you're not able to see it live. But in parting, I want to say you all are in good hands. Um, I will be checking in from time to time, but I have uh, every confidence that the ministry of the church will continue uninterrupted even in this time of uncertainty. So I want you to know I'll miss you all, but I'm really looking forward to sharing with you on what I learned regarding the confessing church movement in pre-World War II Germany. I look forward to sharing that with you this fall. Well, this is a time in our service that we usually greet each other, which of course we can't do at this time. But I do want to encourage you to reach out this week to one another by phone, by email, Let people know that you're thinking of them and that you care. Uh, Call someone who may be isolated or alone and, and lift them up in your prayers. And now we turn our attention to the worship of God on this third Sunday of May. And today our focus will be on what St. Paul has to say about being content. So as we gather for this time of online worship, we ask for God's Spirit to be present to speak to us through the words of Scripture, through our prayers, and through our meditations as we worship together in song. Our opening hymn for today is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Yes. 
Good morning. As we continue in this time of worship, let's join together in our responsive psalm and chorus. We'll sing together verse 3 of This Is My Father's World, and we'll have a a psalm with the text on the screen that we encourage you to join in with us. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. We are told by God that we can come to the throne of glory with anything that we need and ask of him, and he will hear us. So this morning, as we come to the throne, praying with each other, let us bow our heads and ask God for the most important things in our lives, things we need, his grace and his power. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we need strength during these difficult times. We ask for you to touch our hearts with your love to give us strength and to lift us out of whatever is happening in these hopeless times. In your holy word, you affirm the promise that you are always with us. And it is in that promise that we ask that you help us surrender ourselves to you. Help us to realize that our strength is not always enough to get through the dire straits of this earthly existence. It's in these difficult times that we rely on you for the extra strength to help us sustain when our own strength falls short. Lord, you are holy above all others, and all the strength we need is found in you. We are not asking for you to take away the trials we face, but rather to walk with us, beside us, and even carry us when we can't stand on our own. Thank you for always listening and allowing us to rely on you when we cry out to you in our time of need. In the midst of this uncharted territory, as we begin the process of moving forward during the pandemic, we ask for you to be with us, that your will will be done, and that your wisdom goes into all decisions. As people who believe your promises, we believe that your power is more than sufficient. Reach down and touch us as we heal physically, mentally, and emotionally. Help us not to worry about tomorrow, but to hold on to the knowledge that you will take care of every day. And let your very presence fill both the earth and the hearts of the people who inhabit it. Grant your compassion upon all those who are suffering every kind of distress at this difficult time. And help all of us to be at peace. Put aside all our anxious thoughts and allow us to use your strength as our shield. Gracious Heavenly Father, help those feeling isolated to experience communion with you. Help those questioning their faith to affirm their need for you. Help those infected to get the help that they need to recover. Help those who are frustrated with uncertainty to take on the mindset of Christ. Help those who live in fear to move their focus away from the stressors and onto the blessings that they have. 
Help parents to have patience and clarity of mind so they might uplift and encourage their families. Help those who find themselves unemployed to live in peace and not fear the future. Help those who own businesses to make decisions that are in line with your will. Help all health care workers to weather the storm of showing compassion and mourning the loss of their patients. And help all churches throughout the world to reach out as your hands and feet as they seek to overcome the challenges of social distancing. And Lord, for our own congregation, we lift before you Hugh, Jack, Janice, Jackie, Monique, Susan, Earl, Ebriel, Louise, and the Allen, Amy, and Filoni families. And now we ask that you spend a moment in silence as we offer before you, Lord, all the intentions of our own heart. Almighty and everlasting God, remind us that you truly do hear our prayers. Remind us that we should live our lives with intentionality and the purpose that you set before us. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. And we ask that you let the assurance of your presence with us now and always give us comfort. And so we turn and allow you to comfort us as we comfort one another. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now we come together with one voice as we say the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For nine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Each week we take up an offering which is both a symbolic and practical reminder of who the church is and what we do. We understand that it's through your giving that the practical needs of the ministry are met. But we also understand that by giving our tithes and offering during our worship services, we represent a gathered worshiping community who wishes to express its thankfulness to God for the blessings of abundance. In essence, we visually bring in the harvest and offer it at the foot of the altar. You may support our ministry here at the church by mailing a check to the church office or going to give.dewittchurch.org to contribute. And our offerings show that the act of giving is an essential part of the spiritual well-being as everything else we do here in the worship is. This morning, we ask that you prayerfully consider supporting the ministries of DeWitt Community Church and following Christ's mandate to spread the good news and serve as his hands and feet in the community. So let us now receive our morning offering in a spirit of grateful worship and fellowship before God this day. Let us pray together as we give God our tithes and offerings. Will you join me? 
Everlasting Father, thank you that you are the light of the world, guiding our steps on your path. Your word said that the earth is yours and everything in it belongs to you. The world and all its people belong to you. And we recognize that everything we have is actually yours. We acknowledge that we are blessed beyond measure. And now we offer back to you a portion of those blessings as we give them to you in light of who God is to us. May God the Father prepare our journey, Jesus the Son guide our footsteps, and the Holy Spirit watch over us on each path we take. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm glad that you're joining with us for worship. And parents, if there are kids in the household, uh, if you want to invite them, uh, I have a message for the children this morning, and I'll just wait a few moments for them to come in the room. Again, good morning, boys and girls. I don't know about you, but I just love candy. And there are some candies that I just love a lot. Particularly, I really love M&Ms. And if we were hanging out, and it was safe to hang out, and, and I suddenly uh, started eating a, a bag of M&Ms, you'd probably wonder if, if I'd share it. And of course, if it's safe to do so, I, I'd share it. And uh, maybe I'd even have an extra bag of M&Ms for you. And so I, I, I'd safely uh, share the M&Ms with you. But let's say for a moment someone else comes along, and we're both enjoying our bag of M&Ms, and they see that we're eating M&Ms, and I want to share it, and so I, I give them the next bag that I have. Now, you can see that this is a bigger bag than what we were sharing, but this is the bag I have, so I would share it with them. Well, then the three of us, we're all enjoying eating M&Ms, and, and then another person comes by, and I say, uh, would you like to eat some M&Ms with us? And they say, sure. Well, the next bag I have is this one, <laughs> this big bag. And so I share that with them. Now, you may think about all these M&Ms and sharing and noticing that all of these M&Ms are all different sizes. And first I shared the small bag, and then I shared the medium-sized bag, and then finally I, I shared this big one. I don't know about you, but when I see a bag of M&Ms, my eyes get big. And, and I just see the size of him, just like, wow, that's a lot. Well, did you know that a long time ago, uh, there was a man named Paul who wrote about being thankful for what we have. And he was writing to a group of Christians called the Philippians. And he wrote to them about being thankful for what we have. You know, sometimes, boys and girls, that we see what we have or see what someone else's have, and we may... We may really want what they have because it's bigger or better. Maybe it might be a brand new bike or a new gaming system or something that we really want and we really, really spend a lot of time thinking about it. Well, Paul was writing to these Christians and told them that we all must be thankful for what we have. And he wrote to them about how we should be thankful to God for what we have. And we shouldn't spend a lot of time wanting what other people have and thinking about and comparing those things. So boys and girls, this morning I want you to think about all the wonderful things that you have. Think about your family, your friends, where you live, if you have any pets, if you have any other extended family living with you, all the wonderful things God has given us that God wants us to be thankful for what we have and not to spend so much time wanting what other people have. I know it's something hard to do, but God asks each of us to give thanks. So let's do that this morning. Let's thank God for all that God has given to us and not to worry about bigger and better things, but just to say thank you. Let's pray. God, we know that you love us so much. And God, today, this morning, we're so thankful for all the wonderful things. God, there's so much that's around us that may be bigger and better than what we have, but God, help us to have thankful hearts of what we do have. Our parents, and if we have a bicycle or toys or a gaming system or electronic device, whatever we have, God, help us to be thankful for that. God, help us be as Paul encouraged us to be, being thankful 
for all that You have given us. For our family, for our friends, for the things that really matter. God, help us have bigger hearts of thankfulness this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me, boys and girls.
Thank you, uh, Nick and Abby and Abel. Our scripture reading for today comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, and we'll be looking at just two verses at verses 12 and 13. As many of you know, Philippians comes from the pen of St. Paul as he writes this letter from a prison cell where he's in jail for spreading Christianity. In our scripture reading for today, he writes this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in poverty, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you might use these words from your servant Paul to speak to us today, challenge our thinking, expand our hearts, and speak to us, we pray, through the whispers of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Being content, that's really the bottom line of what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, if you were to come up with one word that is a goal for most people, the, this word kind of captures it, being content. Webster defines it as a state of peaceful happiness, satisfied with a certain level of achievement, good fortune, and not wishing for more. But how many people really achieve that state? How many people really feel content at exactly where they're at? And is it such a bad thing to want for more? to reach for higher goals, to, to not be happy with the status quo, to strive for, for growth and improvement. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Philippi, writes to the people of this congregation, be content no matter your lot, being plenty or poverty. And remember, he's writing this letter from inside of a prison cell, so it's not like he's on Happy Street. Now, before we go any further, I want to point out to you that this is the very same letter that Paul writes that we are to run the race of life in a way in which we can win the prize, to run flat out towards the goal that God has set before us, to never settle, to press on, to push the pedal to the metal, so to speak. So I have this question rattling around in my mind. How are we to follow these two different sets of instructions? They seem to kind of be at odds with each other. On one hand, Paul tells the people at Philippi and us to press on, to go for it, to pursue the prize with every fiber in our being. And on the other hand, he writes, be content in any and every situation. Being kind of a goal-oriented person myself, I kind of prefer the press-on message. I prefer the go for the gold kind of thinking. That verse has always kind of revved me up, motivating me to, to go out there and run the race that God has put before me with every ounce of energy that I have. But today, the advice that St. Paul gives us says, be content with whatever you have, whether it's a little or a lot. Be content with wherever you are. Now, when we put these two pieces of advice next to each other, I have to ask the question, okay, Paul, which is it? Go for it or be content with the way things are? You see, in my mind, part of being goal-oriented has to do with refusing to be satisfied with the present. I want to always press towards the goal that's been set before me and not rest until I get there. 
I want to be a more devoted follower of Christ. And while I can look back over the past several years and think I've kind of moved forward in that direction, I still feel that I have a long way to go. That now is not the time to kind of kick back and take it easy and get all happy with myself. I need to keep pressing on. So should I just be content and stop pressing forward? If I'm content, doesn't that give me the excuse to kind of prop up my feet, kick back, and just be lazy? How can I be content? Because I'm not there yet. Well, I want to introduce you to a term that I find myself using quite often. And the term is, it's both. It's both and, not either or. Both and, not either or, is a combination of both words, both and and. And the idea behind this little expression is that you can look at two different competing ideas that at first seem to be contrary with each other and bring them together in a way that complement each other. Let me give you this example. Jesus said in Matthew 10 that we are to be as cunning as serpents and as gentle as doves. Being as cunning as a serpent, while at the same time you're being gentle as a dove. It's not either or. It's not that we are either peaceful like doves or cunning like serpents. It's that we are both. That we need to use both traits together. Now, some people have this idea that Jesus taught that Christianity is about being always nice and kind and gentle and loving. And all those are really good things, which I think Jesus wants us to be. But at the same time, Jesus taught that we're in a world where there is evil, and evil people do evil things. And Jesus is saying, yes, be gentle. Yes, be loving. Yes, be kind. But don't be stupid. Use your brain. Jesus also said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Be discerning. Be loving, but use your brain at the same time. This is one of those both and kind of situations. So this go for the goal idea, and this be content idea do not fall into a mutually exclusive category. They fall into a both and category. Move towards the goal that God has given you, but find God's contentment in your heart with wherever you are right now, even as you run that race towards the goals God has given you. Now I have to confess to you that I find this to be a challenging balance. I was brought up with the idea that you don't rest until you're finished. You don't back off one inch until you've achieved your goal. You keep your nose to the grindstone until the job is done. And when it's done, you take a few minutes, celebrate, and then you move on to the next goal. And I know a number of you were brought up with the same kind of thinking pattern. It's almost like you refuse to be content until you reach the goal And you use that discontentment as fuel that keeps you going. And I've got to confess to you, that's just not a good way to live. As long as you're alive and breathing, God wants you to move towards that goal that he's given you. But, and this is a big but, but at the same time, God wants you to be content in the present along every mile of the journey. God wants you to be content in every leg of the race, And not just when you reach the finish finish line. It's both and kind of thing. Keep moving towards the goal and being content at the same time. You know, throughout Scripture, you'll find this contrarian way of thinking. And some people will tend to focus on one angle. Other folks will, will focus on another angle. And it's not that they are two competing ideas, but the truth lies in the balance. Throughout seminary, it was drummed into our heads to look at the whole of Scripture, not just to zero in on one particular text or uh, one particular viewpoint. We were taught that Scripture should be interpreted as a whole, that Scripture helps us to interpret Scripture, and that understanding the content and language is key to understanding the true message. Now, when you read the text for today from Philippians 4, 12, and 13, you'll see that Paul approached this topic of contentment from a material point of view. He says, I've learned to be satisfied with what I have. 
I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have more than enough. I'm content, whether I'm full or hungry, whether I have a little or a lot. You know, it seems that many people equate contentment with material well-being. That contentment comes from something that we can write a check for. In today's consumer-oriented society like ours, we get the message over and over again that contentment comes from owning the right kind of car, wearing the right kind of clothes, or even hanging out with the right kinds of people. That contentment and status are somehow linked. But the message gets planted in our heads that contentment is this kind of acquired thing. And Paul's advice tells us to see that that kind of thinking is just plain distorted. The truth is there is nothing out there that you can put on your American Express card that will bring you true commitment to contentment. Paul is saying that contentment is not out there somewhere. The true contentment is in here that it's a spiritual thing. The other day I was listening to a sermon that a friend of mine was giving at his church. And in this message, he told his congregation about a book that he was reading called The New New Thing. And in this book, the author writes about this guy by the name of Jim Clark. Uh, Jim had built and then sold three billion dollar businesses. Of course, that left this guy very wealthy, yet he wasn't a very contented man. The author of this book, Michael Lewis, questions Jim Clark and says, I remember the day, uh, Jim, when you said if you ever had $10 million, you'd be happy. And then you got 10. I remember the day when you said if you ever hit a mil- $100 million, you'd be happy. Then you got $100 million. Then I remember the day when you said if I ever became an after-tax billionaire, it would be enough, that that would make you happy. Michael Lewis says, He's got it. Jim has more than a billion dollars after tax, but he's still not happy. In fact, here's how the author describes Jim Clark at the end of the book. No matter how well Jim Clark does for himself, it's always 2 a.m. in the morning, and his heart is pounding, and he's laying awake worrying. Because it's never enough, and it never will be enough. That's a poignant description of discontentment. A billion dollars in the day, and he can't sleep at night. A billion dollars in the bank, it's not enough. That's what discontentment can do to you. Now you may think that only the super rich are afflicted by this stuff. But start reading some of the statistics of people who spend big chunks of money buying lottery tickets or who are all up at night gambling in the casinos or the people who max out half a dozen credit cards. It's not just the super rich who chase after contentment throwing money at it. Lower income and middle income people catch the disease of discontentment thinking that material wealth will bail them out. But you know what? It doesn't. Discontentment is a deadly disease. And when this disease strikes, uh, a fine-running three-year-old car becomes an embarrassment that must be replaced by something newer with more horsepower. When this disease strikes, we utter words like, I have absolutely nothing to wear, even though your closet is stuffed full of clothing. Every day, we have to do battle with the monster of more that insatiable appetite for one more acquisition, for one more purchase, for one more upgrade, for one more decimal point. And one of the lessons that I think many people are learning during this pandemic is really just how vulnerable we are no matter how much stuff we have. I think of the story of the rich farmer that Jesus told about, about the guy who had to build bigger and bigger barns because he had all this stuff Stuff. And Jesus said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be required from you. And then who's going to get all this stuff that you've stored up?
for yourself. Better to be rich in the things of heaven than to store up your riches here on earth where moth and, uh, and rust can, can destroy. But Paul says, feast or famine, it doesn't really matter. Because contentment has to do with what's in here. What's God-given, not what's out there. And Paul says that with Christ in my heart, I'm content. I'm content when I only have a little. I'm content when I have a lot. I'm content anywhere, any circumstance, any situation, because it's Christ that fills my heart. And again, Paul is not writing this letter from a yacht out in the Mediterranean. He's in a prison cell, under arrest for teaching people about Jesus, possibly facing torture and death. But he's saying, I'm okay with it because my contentment is not related to my circumstance. It's a powerful secret. Your contentment is not conditional on getting that promotion. It's not conditional on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's not really conditional on anything you can achieve or obtain. Contentment comes from being satisfied with what you have and who you are now, even with the circumstances you have right now. Our closing hymn is an amazing case in point. I want to give you a little background on this hymn before we close our service by singing that. In 1871, tragedy struck Chicago as fire ravaged the city. When it was all over, 300 people were dead and 100,000 people were homeless. Horatio Gates Spafford was one of those who tried to help the people of the city get back on their feet. He was a lawyer who had invested much of his money into the downtown Chicago real estate where he'd lost a great deal to the fire. And his one son, he had four daughters, had died about the same time. Still, for two years, Spafford, who was a friend of the evangelist Dwight Moody, assisted the homeless, impoverished and grief-stricken, ruined by the fire. After about two years of work, Spafford and his family decided to take a vacation. They were going to go to England to join Moody in one of his crusades, then travel in Europe. Horatio Spafford was, was delayed by some business, but sent his family on ahead. He would catch up to them later on the other side of the Atlantic. Their ship never made it. Off the coast of Newfoundland, it collided with an English sailing ship, and it sunk within 20 minutes. Though Horatio's wife, Anna, was able to cling to a piece of floating wreckage, she was one of only 47 survivors among hundreds. Their four daughters were all killed. Horatio received a a, a, horrible telegram from his wife with only two words, saved alone. Spafford boarded a a boat the next day to go to be with his grief-stricken wife. And the two finally met up with Dwight Moody. It is well, Stafford told him quietly, it is well with my soul. The reports vary to when he did so. Spafford was led during those days of overwhelming grief to pen the words of this amazing hymn. It is well with my soul. I encourage you to listen very carefully to the words as Nick and Abby sing it.
together. Lord God, we're so thankful for our faith, our faith that provides a solid foundation no matter what we face. Lord, continue to direct us and guide us to the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us that peace that passes all human understanding. Guard our hearts and our minds, we pray. Amen.